Hey guys, welcome back to the Mind of Brandon, and welcome to my new office. That's right, I moved. I'm rich, bitches. <laughs> yeah, I'm rich. I'm rich. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, I, I'm I'm still poor. I, I I still live in my mom's house. I just I just moved downstairs. But anyway, uh, today I just wanted to do uh, another response video to the YouTube user capturing Christianity. Uh, th this time I wanted to respond to when he said this. In reality, there's loads of evidence for God's existence. Recently, a book came out called Two Dozen or So Arguments for God, edited by Jerry Walls, if you can see it, and Trent Doherty. This book features dozens of peer-reviewed articles from dozens of PhD philosophers giving arguments and evidence for God's existence. Now, some of the arguments in here are new, and that's really exciting, but many of the ideas, the core ideas focused on in this book, have been around for centuries. For example, the contingency argument for God's existence has been around since at least the 9th century and has been talked about by philosophers ever since. Okay, I'm, I'm not really sure what your, your point is. Like, are, are you thinking that the contingency argument is somehow evidence for God's existence or, or that it does a good job explaining the evidence for God's existence? Because I gotta tell you, like, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the contingency argument and it's pretty awful. I mean, let's just have a look at it. So the slide that we're looking at right now is one that I found in a YouTube video where the Christian apologist William Lane Craig was explaining the contingency argument. So it's, it's broken into four premises, as you can see. The first premise is everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or in an external cause. Okay. Uh, now, as an opinion, I agree with this, okay? <laughs> uh, as an opinion, I roughly agree with this. All right. Now, the second premise, the universe exists. Again, I roughly agree with this, but I would prefer it if it was worded a little bit differently. Like, uh, instead of saying the universe exists, say our universe exists. Because if you say the universe exists, then it, it kind of makes it sound like there's only one, which is probably not true. This, of course, is one of those things that the renowned astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about in his lectures. As Professor Tyson has explained in his lectures, the various naturally occurring things observed in this universe are produced in multiples. None of it's really unique. Of the various elementary particles that we've observed, each of those is produced in multiples. Same is true of the various subatomic particles and atoms and molecules, the various compounds of matter that go into planets, moons, asteroids, comets, you, me, right? Even stars are produced in multiples. The galaxies are produced in multiples, right? Are we supposed to think there's just one universe? <laughs> that would be that would be inconsistent with the pattern of evidence observed so far. Okay, our our universe is even expanding, which should raise the question: into what? Into what is our universe expanding? The fact that it's expanding demonstrates that there's a larger space into which our universe can move. Apparently, that space has the ability to produce a universe. Based on the pattern of evidence, probably multiple universes. Okay? We don't have a good reason to think this universe is the only one. It could be. Right? We want to we stay open-minded to the slim possibility that this is the only universe. It's just that based on the pattern of evidence that's available to us, it's probably not. There's probably other universes. But anyway, let's get back to the contingency argument. Number three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is an external, transcendent, personal cause. So as a proponent for the idea that our universe was produced by a multiverse, I don't really take issue with the concept that our universe has an external transcendent cause. 
I do, however, take issue with the concept that it has a personal cause. You see, the reason I don't take issue with saying, you know, that there's an external cause or a transcendent cause, right, is because that's consistent with the evidence that's available to us. What about the personal cause? Is that consistent with the available evidence? Not so far as I can tell. Like, this is, this is something you'd have to argue separately. You'd have to, like, explain, well, here's the evidence for the personal cause. And the contingency argument doesn't do that. Which is, which is why, like, by the time we get to, you know, part four, it's just like, wow, this argument is really weak. Like, why do, why do people think this is a good argument? Let, let's, let's go ahead and look at part four. Therefore, the explanation of the existence of the universe is an external transcendent personal cause. And of course, the guy who came up with this contingency argument is thinking that this external transcendent personal cause is God. Well, that's it, folks. That concludes the contingency argument. As you all saw for yourselves, nowhere in that entire argument was there any evidence whatsoever for God's existence. Do let me know if you disagree. I'd, uh, I'd like to have you point out for me exactly where in the contingency argument there is somehow evidence for God's existence, because I'm sure not seeing it. In what follows, I'm going to lay out three pieces of evidence that I think support theism over naturalism. The first piece of evidence is the existence of dependent things. Mm, no, I don't, I don't really see how dependent things work as evidence for God's existence. Uh, I mean, you can, you can offer up God as a possible explanation for the existence of dependent things, but there's also naturalistic explanations, so I don't... <laughs> Oh, this guy. Everything in our experience exists dependently. Well, that's certainly not true. In fact, capturing Christianity just a, a little bit later is going to wind up contradicting himself. He's actually going to give an example of something that doesn't exist dependently. This mug on my desk, for example, depends on other things for its existence. It hasn't always been here. It was built. My computer, my speakers, my headphones, my house... Every, literally everything that we come in contact with depends on something else for its existence. Literally everything he just mentioned there is an example of human technology. Capturing Christianity, I'm going to awe you. Just because there's such a thing as human technology, it doesn't mean that literally everything that we experience is dependent on something else. Which you apparently realize because you go on to say this. But, and here's the really interesting thing about this, is that if you think about reality as a whole, all of reality exists independently. The dude literally just got done saying, literally everything that we come in contact with depends on something else for its existence. But now he's saying, all of reality exists independently. Well, which is it capturing Christianity? Is it literally everything in our experience that's dependent? Or is reality as a whole independent? There can't be an outside explanation of everything that exists. That's actually impossible. Agreed. The omniverse that represents the totality of all that exists is something that exists by the necessity of its own nature. Now, the reason why this is puzzling is because in the same way that you can't build a brick house out of water... You sure about that? I mean, there's several different ways you can get a brick house from water. You, you actually don't even have to rely on freezing temperatures, since water could take a solid form under sufficient pressure. You can't get an independent existence out of dependent things. Not sure what relevance this has. I'm starting to get bored. Dr. Josh Rasmussen, who I've had on the channel a bunch, he calls this a construction problem. Adding more and more dependent things together doesn't suddenly make the group independent. So? I don't, I don't get what the point is. What, what, what is this? Aren't, are we talking about the, the evidence for God? Like, what is, dude, what are you doing? A group of 10 cameras, for example, is not suddenly independent because you have a group of 10. What the fuck does this have to do with, uh, were, weren't you trying to, like, make a case for the existence of God? Like, how... How do you accomplish this talking about, you know, oh, having groups of dependent things doesn't make them independent. Like, what does that have to do with providing evidence for the existence of God? 
Oh, that's right, nothing. But again, the question is, how can all of reality exist independently when the building blocks of reality that we're familiar with exist dependently? Okay, there's multiple ways of interpreting what you just said there. I don't know what the fuck is going on. This guy's so fucking confusing. The solution to this problem of dependence, as it's known in the literature, is to posit a necessary foundation that has its existence independently. Oh, you mean like energy? Yeah. Can't be created, can't be destroyed, can only change. If it can't be created, yet it exists, that means it's always existed, right? Yeah. Doesn't know its existence to anything else. It, it exists independently, right? It exists by the necessity of its own nature. The reason that reality in total is independent, even though everything we experience is dependent, is because there is a necessary thing at the foundation of reality that explains everything else. Well, that was a little clunkily worded in some parts, but uh, yeah, uh, like you know, energy in the, the vacuum of space, right? Vacuum energy, right? It can produce elementary particles that you know go into the formation of subatomic particles, that go into the atoms, that go into the molecules, go into the various compounds of matter that make up you know, planets, moons, asteroids, comets, you, me, so on and so forth. This solves the puzzle, and notice what we have here. We have a necessary thing at the foundation of reality. Well, your wording is a little clunky again, but, but yes, we do have a necessary thing, right? Energy. It goes into all the space, time, matter. It's, it's everywhere. It's in everything. Like, a little, every little point in space contains energy, right? It's, it's fundamental. Now, I think that this necessary thing would actually have to be perfect in order to have the kind of independent existence that it has. Well, I don't see any reason to think that it's perfect. Uh, the, the fact that it's independent doesn't seem to imbue it with any kind of perfect quality. I, like, I, I don't, I don't get like how that would work. Like, like, why would it being, like, why would the independence of it somehow all by itself mean, oh, it's perfect? Like, I, it just doesn't, it doesn't follow. It's, it's, it's a non sequitur. Well, let's turn and look at two additional pieces of evidence that I think help flesh out this concept further, that this necessary foundation is both personal and good. Good? Like, like as in, like, morally? <laughs> see that little point in space right there? All right, right, right there. You see that? <laughs> you see what I'm pointing at right now? <laughs> all right, okay, so, so you're telling me that, that that point in space right there, that that contains energy, okay, this this fundamental necessary thing, this independent thing, you're telling me that that, that energy there is morally good. Okay, I, I better suck some of that up real quick. Ah, yeah, let's get some of that good. I mean, it's not it's not just there, it's it's in, there's energy in all of us, okay? This, this fundamental necessary ind independent, it's inside of all of us. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to basically, like, basically everything would have to be, like, morally good. If, if, if you're saying that energy is morally good. You're not talking about energy, though. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't fucking studied this stuff. You probably didn't even know the particles form from fucking vacuum energy. The second piece of evidence that I'll touch on is called fine-tuning. No, no, we're not, we're not doing that today. Okay, uh, you know. Maybe I'll come back and listen to what he has to say about fine tuning in some future video. Maybe, okay. But for now, I'm I'm already pretty confident he hasn't been watching enough Neil deGrasse Tyson lectures or Sean Carroll lectures. Uh, this guy just he's he's not getting into all the necessary quantum mechanics, particle physics, chemistry. <laughs> it's not it's not started. He's not studying all this shit, right? Conservation of energy. He doesn't know all this stuff, okay? He's not a sciencey guy. He's, he's fucking religious. All right, that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, thumb it up, blah blah blah. I don't fucking care. Do what you want. I don't. I don't. I'm. I'm fucking. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs>